from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Welcome, I'm Thea Austin, the Public Events Coordinator of the, the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and on behalf of our entire staff, I'd like to welcome you to the latest concert in our 2011 Homegrown Music of America concert series. Um, the Homegrown series was designed to feature the very best of traditional music, dance, and storytelling from around the nation. The Folklife Center works with the many talented and dedicated state folk arts coordinators from across the country who helped help us select um, the very best and most exciting performers from their communities. This allows us to bring important and representative traditions from around the country right here to Washington, and we work collaboratively with the Millennium Stage at the Kennedy Center to make that possible. Today's performance will be recorded for the permanent collections, and uh, the webcast will be put up on our website as a webcast as well, which reminds me, that little um, call, if, this is a good time to turn off your cell phones if you get it, if, you, if they're on. Um, otherwise, they will be recorded for posterity. Um, today we have a very special concert of storytelling and flute music from the Choctaw people, who now reside largely in Oklahoma, but in a few other states as well. Um, making this concert possible technically, I want to thank uh, Solomon Haile Selassie from the Music Division for doing our, our lights, and Chris Kozlowski and Wiz Casey from National Sound for, for doing the sound for us today. Um, in the American Folklife Center, we have one of the world's largest collections of early Native American recordings of music and speech, including what we consider, what we believe to be the first ethnographic field recording ever made by Jesse Walter Fuchs in 1890 on wax cylinders, the recordings of Passamaquoddy speakers in Maine. We've repatriated many of our recordings back to tribes who've contributed them, and we continue to work with American Indians from all over the country who are doing research in their own languages and traditions. We're very happy to have this concert be part of that effort. We'd now like to welcome Roger Harris of the Oklahoma Folklife Council, who will tell you a little bit about um, the concert today and introduce our performers. Roger Harris. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'd like to introduce two of my friends, uh, Choctaw friends, one from Oklahoma and one who spends his time in Oklahoma but lives in Texas part of the time, uh, shamefully so, I'm afraid. Uh, first, from Oklahoma, DJ Batiste Tomasi. DJ? and Tim Tingle. Well, we want to know, are there any Choctaws in the audience? What do we say to them? Hello. Hello. Chima Chukma. Chima Chukma. I didn't hear that response very good. Hello. Hello. Halito. <laughs> Halito. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to talk for just a moment to kind of introduce who the Choctaw people are, and uh, then Tim will uh, tell a story. And I'm going to be talking about how the Choctaw people came to live in the place called Oklahoma. And uh, in the early 1800s, there was a lot of strife in the United States, especially in the Southeast, a concern about uh, those non-Indian peoples who wanted to live where the Indian peoples lived, and that resulted in an ultimate decision on the part of the federal government to move 
uh, several tribes from the southeast to move them out to what is presently Oklahoma. Uh, that was around 1830 or so when they began to move. And in particular, the Choctaw people who lived in Mississippi uh, began moving around 1832. They were not well provisioned. In fact, none of the tribes who moved were well provisioned. And so they ended up traveling a very difficult road and that difficult road is sometimes called the Trail of Tears. Many of their family members and friends were lost en route, and it was a, a very sad time, still mourned uh, by the peoples who came on the different roads uh, to what is now Oklahoma. The Choctaws left in about uh, 1832, and they uh, crossed over land on foot, a little bit of aid from a few wagons to carry a supply or two, but for the most part, it was only what they could carry on their backs. It was a very, very difficult time. When they arrived in this area that's called Oklahoma, it had no name then. The federal government did not have it on a map. It had no name. It was simply west of Arkansas Territory. So you can imagine these were not just being relocated, these were people being sent to exile in the West somewhere where very few people knew much about. In that place that they landed, they started new homes, built them themselves, of course, from native materials. They started schools, cooperated with mission churches and established churches. They also established their own government, their own constitution. And just before the Civil War, they were thriving. Agriculture was good, transportation on the two main rivers, the Red River and the Arkansas was good, and people were doing very well. And then the Civil War devastated uh, Oklahoma, or Indian Territory as it was called then, more so than any other place in the United States. That's a little known fact, I think, outside of Oklahoma. In any case, it was a tough time again for the same peoples. And then they were also subjected to a lot of government changes in how the treaties were interpreted. And then they began to send young Indian children to Indian boarding schools. And the boarding schools forbid the language that they learned to speak as a child in their family. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. And then they divided the lands that had been held in common up. And to make matters worse, they ended tribal governments in 1907 when Oklahoma became a state. You would think that would have devastated the people. It did not. They still could not vote, although they could join the military and fight for the country, and many did. In fact, World War I, Choctaw Code Talkers were great champions, uh, especially in the European theater uh, where they did extremely well, and again in World War II in the European theater. And then, by the middle part of the 20th century, the Choctaws began to reconstitute themselves. And once they did, it took them about 20 or 30 years to begin to really get everything back in order. During that time, the folks who had held on to the old ways, the traditional ways, were the ones who were relied on the most. And these two folks that are here today are some of those people who have held on to, grasped from the elders, and are now passing it on to others. And so we're going to start by asking Tim if he will uh, tell us a story, please. Sir. I'll be glad to. First, I want to uh, acclimate you to old uh, American Indian uh, tradition that we think might be multi-ethnic because we feel like it didn't necessarily origin itself from Indian culture. 
But the tradition is this, and I welcome you to take part in it. When speaker is introduced, just as I was, audience will clap. So now you've taken part in Indian ritual. <laughs> yeah, which is to say, in trickster rabbit kind of way, that we have our roots very deep in Choctaw tradition, but we're doing fine in modern USA as well. We have, uh, we have acclimated. I want to uh, share a story that my mentor, Charlie Jones, who was our official tribal storyteller for almost half a century, an amazing man, traveled all over the world, sharing Choctaw culture, very distinguished. He could walk into his room. Distinguished is a strange word because he was a very funny man. He was very Choctaw. But he took me, uh, he kind of took me and, and taught me stories, taught me stories. And one thing he said is he realized that uh, I was devoting, I was getting very serious. I was learning the stories. And, uh, we had a moment in which uh, I have been telling for maybe 10 years. And Charlie had been telling before our chiefs, we are a strong government now, our chief's annual State of the Nation address before 90,000 people in a little town of Tuscahoma, which normally has 200. 90,000 people descend for almost a week on this town. 90,000 Choctaws from all over the world. And for almost half a century, Charlie Jones had told the traditional story before the chief gave his annual State of the Nation address. And they had called me about six months before, and they said, he has, he has Alzheimer's. He's not able to do it again. He'll be on the stage with the Supreme Court, the Tribal Council, the chief, the assistant, but would you tell the story? And of course, I was so honored and so happy. And thinking about Charlie, of course, but I was so happy. And I was sitting at a fry bread stand at Labor Day, the day before the speech would happen. And a friend came by, sat down, and said, so I hear you're going to tell the story. And I said, oh, yeah. He said, what story are you going to tell? I said, oh. And I told him. He said, oh, this is so cool. I said, yeah, I'm really excited about all those people, a big screen TV. This will be cool. And then what are the chances on a place with 90,000 people spread out how many acres that at that moment, Charlie Jones and an old councilman would walk around the corner of the trailer and not see me. But they were this close. And his friend said, put his arm around him and said, so, Charlie, I hear you're not going to be telling this year. We're going to miss you. And Charlie said, well, I'm going to miss it too. I guess, I, I guess I'm just too old. And then they walked on. And it made everything different for me. It was a sacred moment. And all the pride and all of that was gone. All of that was gone. And when I told my story, he got up and he had a beautiful gift to give to me. And I took it as a passing on. And I know that someday that I will stand up and I will approach someone and I will give them a special gift as I sit down and someone else becomes the storyteller. That's how it is. It's the passing on. And one of the things that Charlie told me is he realized this would be a career and it would be something I was doing. He said, there will be a time when you will speak at a special place. And you'll be speaking in lots of different auditoriums and places. And there will be a time when there will be as many empty, maybe more seats as there are filled seats. And he said, that is the time to smile and know it doesn't mean that people don't want to see you. It means that the elders, the shalombish, the walking people, the dead and gone but still with his people, haven't heard you tell enough stories lately, and they've created situations on earth so so many other people will live so many empty seats, so there will be plenty of seats for the elders. So when you look out, don't see empty seats. See members of your family who have passed on. See members of your family who you had never seen but have passed on but are there. See members of the family of the audience so they can feel that next to them and what they think is an empty seat 
is someone they care deeply about, too. And there was another side of Charlie Jones. <laughs> and this was the first story he ever taught me. Long, long, way back long ago, in the land of the Choctaws, there was Rabbit. Now, ra oh, I'm sorry, I almost forgot to tell you, when I do there was Rabbit, you have to make rabbit ears. Everybody, and I have an interesting definition of the word everybody, it simply means you. <laughs> Especially the kid sitting next to his big sister that chewed the bubble gum and swallowed it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Long ago in the land of the Choctaws, there was Rabbit. Good. And Rabbit had one problem. Rabbit just wouldn't stop talking. Unless I'll say it, Rabbit just wouldn't stop talking. He went on and on and on. And there was also Fox. Fox had a regular house, four Fox children and his Fox wife. And every morning, Fox would go down to the river and fish for catfish. He would sling that fish and then out, shoo! Plop, reel it in. Shoo, 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 shoo. Here we go. We all get to fish. Are you all ready? Shoo! Oh, I wait a second. I'm sorry. Is it okay to say y'all here? Do they know what that means? <laughs> y'all, it's like you plural. Okay. Here we go, everybody. Shoo! Plop. Shoo! 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 Plop. Shoo! 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 Plop. Shoo! 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 Now, since most of you were raised in Greco-Roman, Judeo-Christian, Western European scientific worldview, you would, in a traditional folktale, expect there to be three slingings of the catfish line, three jobs for the prince to do the rescue of the princess, three, 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 but this is Indian culture. Our number is four. <laughs> so we will sling the catfish line one more time. Are you ready? Here we go. Shoo! Plop! Shoo, shoo. Good. And on the day of the story, he had caught just enough catfish to feed his family. And he knew his wife would have that cornbread batter. She would make homemade hush puppies. She would have that skillet popping hot. She cornbread batter. Woo, it would be good. But along came trouble. And the trouble is this. Once you catch catfish before you fry it, it smells pew-wee bad. Let's all say that. Pew-wee bag. <laughs> that was good. And that fishy smell worked itself all the way, let's all do this, all the way around the nose of that old rabbit. Keep your ears up now, because the rabbit's going to talk. He said, smell like fish to me. Y'all ready? Smell like fish to me. So rabbit went, hip hoppity, hip hoppity, hip hoppity. Hip. Yeah, y'all get to do that. And remember, it's not shoulder hoppity, shoulder hoppity. It's hip hoppity, hip hoppity. Here we go. Are y'all ready? Here we go. Hip hoppity, hip hoppity. <laughs> That's good. And he jumped right in front of that fox and he said, give me that fish. Can y'all say that? Give me that fish. And the fox said, no way. Here we go. No way. But you know, rabbit, he just, say it with me, what a stop talk. He went on and on and on and on. Finally, fox realized the only way to get rid of that rabbit was to trick him. Oh, almost forgot to tell you. This was back so far long ago that rabbit had a long, beautiful, bushy, Tail. Here we go. A long, beautiful, bushy tail. Good. Not at all like that powder puff of a tail like he's got today. And I'm glad I remembered because this is how it got that way. Fox took one look at that tail, said, Rabbit, you want to go fishing? You go down to the icy part of the river. You throw a rock, chunk it, bust a hole in the ice, and you stick your tail down in the ice water. And Rabbit said, won't that be cold? <laughs> See, they always take pictures when I'm looking like a fool. Can't you take it when I'm... Mercy me. <laughs> Here we go. Won't that be cold? Good. <laughs> no, go right ahead. It's natural. What can I say? <laughs> and Fox said, yeah, it'd be cold, but with your tail dangling down there in the water, the fish will grab a hold of it. All you have to do is go flip in your tail, and the fish will go flopping on the shore. You'll get all the fish you want. Rabbit said, I can do Here we go. I can do that. Fox said, I bet you can he picked the fish up and shooey, here we go, shooey, don't you want to take that one? Yeah, there you go, shooey, right, <laughs> okay, so rabbit said, oh, I better go fishing, hip hoppity, no, we already done that, <laughs> never mind, 
He went down to the icy part of the river, stood on the riverbanks, and he was just, he chunked up and he busted the, and just about to step when he realized he was barefoot. He was going to have to sit on that ice on his bare bottom. Don't you be laughing. You don't want to sit on ice on your bare bottom. I don't think so. And then he heard it. And he knew who this was. To American Indian people and others too, it is he who rules everything. It was his tummy growling. <laughs> he who rules all. And he thought, oh, a better step is going to be cold. And he tiptoed out and he got ready to sit down on his bare bottom. Oh, it was cold. I know it made him jump just like you did, ma'am. It made him jump. And then he heard it again. And little by little, he sat down. He put his tail down in the ice water. It was cold, and the fish were swimming. They weren't biting. And then it got to be, and for uh, the narrative arc of the story, pay real close attention to the next line. It got to be freezing cold. Something grabbed a hold of his tail. He said, oh, I caught me a fish. What am I supposed to And he went, flip. But his tail, don't get ahead of me now, sir. His tail stayed right where it was. He said, oh, I caught a big fish. I better go flipping hard. Y'all don't know what it is, do you? He went, flip. And his tail stayed right where it was. He said, oh, all I have to do is count to three. Jump up, I bust the fish through the ice. I never have to work again. So let's all count together. Here we go. One, two, three. Don't be jumping now. Just say one, two, three. Don't want to bust the chairs in this beautiful little auditorium. Okay, here we go. A chuffa. Uh, they should count English. Yeah, okay, you get to count English. I'll count Choctaw. Here we go. Nice and loud. A chaffa. You're supposed to say like one, two, three, okay? <laughs> Did they not give an IQ test with people when they come? Is the mic working here? <laughs> okay, here we go. One, two, three. He jumped up and he said, Ooh, I got my fish. I'll never have to work again. I got my fuck, but wait, I don't see a fish. And he was wondering what could have gone wrong when he felt the cold breeze back where he'd never felt the breeze before. He said, ooh, that's really funny because my tail, where is my tail? And there he saw it. That's right, frozen solid underneath a river of ice, leaving rabbit with nothing but that little powder puff of a tail, just like he's got today. And all because he just wouldn't stop talking and sometimes people will say well people don't have tails and I say that's because every one of us have a little bit of rabbit in us there are times when we just won't stop talking but it's time for me to do so Yako Ki thank you very much you're a wonderful audience thank you very Well, uh, I wanted to ask, what, what did he mean by Yako Ki? Is that, that right? It's the word for thank you, Choctaw, is how we say thank you, Yako Ki, or Yako Ki. See, there are a lot of Choctaw words that are used by people who don't really know anything about Choctaw people or the culture or anything, like the name of the state we come from. That's a, that's, that's a Choctaw word, Oklahoma. Divided in two words, like okla is for people, homa is the color red. So it is the land of the red man or the red people. Yeah. And the most common phrase that folks use, one word phrase, uh, that we think comes from Choctaw, there might be some arguments, is what? Okay. Okay. H-O-K-A-Y. Okay. 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 Yeah. So if you knew a Choctaw and you thought everything was going well, you could say, okay. Chikma is good and okay as well. Chikma, okay. Yeah. Okay. We got, okay. Everything's okay. It's good. Yeah. You know, the languages uh, almost died. And uh, perhaps DJ will tell us a little more about that in a, little, in a bit. And they died, of course, because uh, the government felt, un felt that it was a threat. They thought that all of the native people should, should learn to speak English and should become 
red white people, or white red people, or however you think of it. And uh, of course, that, that didn't work all that well, although some thrived, most had some troubles. Well, the Choctaws thrived mightily, and today are a major political force in Oklahoma, and to some extent, in our country. So tell us about your family, because you have a very interesting Choctaw background. Thank you, Roger. Well, hello, The Trail of Tears Walk of 1832, I was raised to believe and taught that my great-grandmother, Sophie Harrison Kusher, her Choctaw name was Tasehia, which was like the messenger that brought a uh, message, maybe storytellers, you know, to the villages or the tribe, the tribal village or community. Her parents, and she was 115 when she passed, we, were, we figured in our family some years ago in the 70s, her parents were survivors, small children on the Trail of Tears that was in a blizzard, forced to walk in a blizzard, Never told before and only said right now, but that the Mississippi Choctaws have taught me was at gunpoint, where 6,000 Choctaws were massacred. <clears throat> None of their families survived, but as children, they made it to Oklahoma. The story I might add here, Roger, was that my family kept asking the soldiers, when will we get to Indian Territory? We'll tell you, we'll tell you. And as soon as we got to the line, Arkansas and Oklahoma, they actually stepped one step over, said we will move no further. In that area was my great-grandmother, who didn't speak English. She understood it a little bit. And then one day the government came in, and in giving her assistance, she didn't know she would lose her children. But because they didn't speak English, they were put in a boarding school called Dwight Mission. My mother said she wasn't frightened because her dad had worked on a train. So she wasn't afraid of trains, but her uncles and aunts had never seen a train, and they were terrified. But when they got to Dwight Mission, which, by the way, you know, was a good thing in that the missionaries, Choctaws were first met with the Cumberland Presbyterian, became acceptance of each because the prophecies, which our tribe have done for thousands of years and still do, um, or different tribes on this land still have prophecies, had said that these people would come and they would have a similar story. The story I was told is that the elder waited to hear the story of the flood and said, these are our people, these are our relatives. We welcome them. Akinaminoma, all our relations. So back to the school, I said, Mama, what did you do? She was about fifth grade. She said most children didn't speak any English at all, so they were punished if they were caught speaking their language. There were Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminoles, Caddo's, Comanches, Kiowas, lots of different tribes, mostly Cherokee in that part. She said she was around Cherokee so much and heard the language she thought she was Cherokee. But we're Choctaw and Chickasaw. Or Chitta, which is the way we pronounce it, and Chicksa, who were brothers. I said, what was your primer? What was your English book? What did you study? She said it was only the, it was a Bible. The King James Version of the Bible was our English book. I couldn't imagine getting through all those begats even as a child in a second language. She said three hours a day they were, they were taught with the Bible, six days a week. They didn't on Sunday. She said, but we were punished if we were caught speaking our language. And the kids thought they were kind of clever, so you know what they did? They waited until the lights were out at night, and she said languages would just rattle all through the dorm beds, the little bunk beds. And then the matrons came in and said, it's called one for all and all for one. If one of you speaks your language, then all of you will be punished. Some were whipped, 
But the last time she remembers the punishment, she said it was just that they got them up in the early morning, like two or three in the morning, and had the children scrubbing wooden floors with toothbrushes on their knees until breakfast. But they didn't talk. And they were quiet, it seemed, but we do talk a lot, probably, don't we, Tim? They were quiet, and she said, would they try to, they, they wanted to learn this language now because this is what was being um, forced to them and punished if they didn't, and so maybe they need to try to learn this language. But some of them, they couldn't get it all, and they, one would know this word, and a few would know this words, and so they decided to try to put their words together, but they had to sneak off, you know, like under the bushes or trees or the fence line where the matrons or ladies or people of authority couldn't hear them. And all these little kids got together and they said, what do you think they want us to know? What are they trying to teach us? What is the message? <clears throat> they said, we think it's that they want us to get God in our heart. They're saying, get God in your heart. Jehovah is God. Get God in Shalom is your spirit. Get God in your heart? Well, when did he get out? <laughs> they didn't know that. They said, we're Choctaw, we're Indian people. He doesn't ever leave us. God never leaves us. Creator never leaves us. Is that why they're different? Is that why they're mean to us? My mom says we thought maybe that's what had happened to them. And they wanted God back in their heart. She said, so we prayed for them to get God back in their heart. And we think it did. And when we finish a story, we say, aho. So we're going to say, and I pray the flute. I'm an oboist by 22 years ago. And I have to have notes. So with my eyes closed, I will be praying. In spirit, that shalomish. And we say, holy topa for holy spirit. And if you want to say directly to that, or speak directly to that, to the holy spirit, we say ma at the end. Shalomish holy topa ma. And you go gig.
Okay. Thank you. That's uh, restful. You took my voice down about a half an octave, I think. Uh, well, we're going to ask uh, Tim to come up now and tell, tell you a little more about Tim by way of introduction. Tim is uh, uh, one of the nation's best performance storytellers uh, and uh, uh, does other kinds of material besides just strictly material related to the Choctaw people. And also, uh, Tim is a really fine writer. My favorite book uh, that he wrote is called Walking the Choctaw Road. I recommend it to anyone. Uh, it's a good read regardless of your interest, but especially if you want to know a little more about the Choctaw people or about Native America in, in, uh, in general. The other book that I have uh, of Tim's that is a favorite is a children's book called Crossing Bakchito. And uh, I'll let Tim talk a little bit about that, but uh, both of those books are available probably in every library in the United States. So go home and find one or buy one. Thank you. Thank you. I started collecting uh, stories from, uh, from Choctaw Elders of uh, 1988 uh, all over Texas. Uh, Oklahoma, and back to our original homeland in Mississippi. And the story I want to share with you was told by a man who uh, passed on about three years ago. His name's Archie Mingo, and he lived in Neshoba County, not too far from our sacred mound, uh, Nenewaya, which is still our sacred place. It's an origin mound in central Mississippi, close to Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, there's a river called Bochito, There is a river called Bochito that cuts through Mississippi. In the days back before the Trail of Tears, Bochito River was a boundary river. On one side lived the Choctaws, a nation of Indian people. On the other side, plantation owners with their slaves. And if a slave escaped and made his way across that river, the slave owner could not follow. That was the law. And so it was that long ago and far away, when the river was the boundary, one Sunday morning, a Choctaw mama woke her little daughter up saying, Martha Tom, you lazy little girl, you, you get yourself up out of bed. I have a wedding to cook for today. You take this basket and pick me some blackberries. Go now. Martha Tom threw her dress on, grabbed that basket, and she was gone to the river. She filled that basket with blackberries and then realized she hadn't had breakfast yet. She sat down. She ate every berry in the basket, and there were no more berries on her side of the river. So she did something she'd been told never, ever to do. She went crossing Bochito to the slave side. For the only way to cross that river in those days was a stone path just beneath the muddy surface of the water, and only the Choctaws knew it was there, for they had built it. And when the river flooded, they built the stones up. And when the river sank in times of drought, they built the stones down, always unseen beneath muddy waters. She crossed that stone, one slippery stone at a time, went deep into those woods and filled that basket with berries. And then she was lost. She followed people moving, thinking she was going to the river. She was going still deeper into those woods. She came across a clearing headed by a stump covered in grapevines and logs rolled out, almost like they were benches. Then she heard someone coming. She jumped behind that stump. And stepping out of the woods behind her, she saw a skinny little black man with a bush. He had a white hair hobbling on a cane, looking like, don't you be laughing now. You'll be old someday, young man. Don't you laugh. Not nice to make fun of old people. I saw you. And so she scooted around that stump, and here he come trying to catch her going the other way. We talked about that. 
And then that old man, he put his cane down, started stepping up on top of the stump, and Martha Tom realized if that man steps on top of the stump, he's going to be able to look down and see me. I better get into the grapevines. So Martha Tom jumped into those grapevines. I know, she had to do it, though. I didn't mean to startle you, but for the narrative, she really had to get there in a hurry. That's the only reason I did that, ma'am. And she looked through the leaves, and that old man started stomping and clapping and calling out to the woods. We are bound for the promised land. And what happened next changed her life forever. For a hundred voices came, unseen like spirit voices, shivering the low-hanging moss in the trees and responding, We are bound for the promised land. Martha Tom didn't see a soul. That old man, he started stomping and clapping again. He said, who will come and go with me? And it looked like his fingers were lifting people right out of the dark dirt of Mississippi as a hundred slaves stood up from the bushes where they were hiding. It was the calling together of the forbidden slave church deep in those Mississippi woods. And they said, we will come and go with you. We are bound for the promised land. They began to sing that beautiful song. Martha Tom had never heard music like this before, but it touched her deeply. Then something else touched her. It came slithering through the grapevines. It was a man's hand. It tapped. She looked up to see the biggest man she'd ever seen in her entire life. His chest was so big it was about to pop the buttons right off of his shirt. And he said, you're lost, little girl. Martha Tom said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He said, you're talked off from across that river. Mm-hmm, mm You're scared. You want to go home. Mm-hmm, He said, what's your name, little girl? She said, mm-hmm, He said, I never met a little girl named mm-hmm, she said, Mr., my name is not, mm-hmm, my name, and by now she was laughing so hard. She said, my name is, <laughs> he said, I sure never a little girl with a name like, <laughs> she said, Mr., my name is Martha Tom, and he said, well, at least you're laughing, hon, because when I first saw you, you were so scared, your teeth were about to chatter right out of your skull, and she laughed, she slapped his britches again, she said, I'm Martha Tom, and he said, I'll get my son. He'll get you to the river. Little Mo, he called out. There appeared a thin little boy, about 10. His daddy said, Little Mo, this here's Martha Tom, and she's Choctaw. You need to get her to the river. Little Mo said, I better not, Dad. The people in the plantation house, they're always telling us if we're seen playing too close to the river, they think we're trying to escape. Our whole family gets in trouble. His father was undaunted. He knelt down. He said, Son, There's a way to move amongst them where they won't even see you. Here's what you do, son. You move not too fast, not too slow, eyes to the ground. Way you go. You'll be invisible, son. Now get this little girl to the river. Well, it sounded like a fun game to play, so he took Martha Tom and off they went. Not too fast, not too slow, eyes to the ground. Way you go. They soon arrived at the river. And Martha Tom thought this would be a fun game to play. She knew he couldn't see the stones. She put him right there by the path. She said, you looky what I can do. And she took off walking. She turned around about 10 steps later and took off running to the river. He said, looky little girl, there's no boat or bridge. What is She jumped from the shore. She landed on the water. She stood up. He jumped back. He said, little girl, little girl, what kind of a witch are you? She said, I don't know. Witch. Come on, you can do it too, you say. She said, go ahead, put your toe in. You see, it's a test to be safe. But what if I put my toe in and a big old snapping turtle comes and bites my toe off? That's not safe, she laughed. She said, oh, it's safe. You can trust me. Your father saved my life. If your father hadn't found me, but the people in the plantation house found me, she said, They would never let me go home. I would be their little inside the house worker girl until I had to work in the fields like your family does. And then she says something that caught little Mo and most Americans by surprise. She said, who do you think were their slaves before they brought your people here? It was us. Would never hurt your family. I want you to meet mine. And little Mo looked at her and he decided to do something he had never done before. He decided to trust someone of a different color. And when he put his foot through the water, he didn't know what it would touch, but 
as so many people say where I come from, when his foot touched the stone, it was como milagro. It was como milagro. Every step was miracle. And he reached the center of the river. He squeezed her hand. He said, how long has the path been here? She said, I don't know, maybe forever. And he thought to himself, so the path to freedom is always there if you learn to see it. The path to freedom is always there if you learn to see it. And even before they stepped from the stones to the earth, they could hear the old man beginning the old wedding chant to call everyone together. They saw people stepping from log homes for we Choctaws. We had log homes in 1491. We already had them. The old men began to sing the old wedding chant. Way, hey, ah, you are you you are 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 you you this began a friendship that would last for years as every Sunday morning, Martha Tom would cross that river. She would sit with little Mo and his family and learn those songs in English and Choctaw. She would sing them every Sunday on her way home. Then trouble came. There was a slave sale and 20 slaves were sold to go to New Orleans very next morning before sunrise. And the only name on that list from little Mo's family was his mother. And that night at the supper table, she began to cry and shake her head. She said, I'll grab my clothes, I'll run to the woods. His father said, you don't want the children to see the dogs drag you back. And then little Mo stood up, he said, Daddy, we can stay together as a family. I know the Choctaw path across the river. His father said, they'll have the dogs out tonight to prevent the crossing. And little Mo said, just like you taught me, Dad, not too fast, not too slow, eyes to the ground, away we go. We'll be invisible. We have to try. And for the first time, the father saw the faith in his boy's face. He grabbed pillowcases, tossed one to every member of the family. He said, run to your corners and pack quick. Hurry. They packed quick, but not quick enough. The men in the plantation house saw them working late. They surrounded that little house in the woods with dogs and lanterns and guns, tossing their jackets over the lanterns so they hid in the darkness, lifting their loaded shotguns to both front and back door, both. With his family around him, little Mo's father said, looking to the back door, we could go out that way. It might be dark and safer there, but this night's journey is not about darkness. It is not about safety. It is about faith and freedom. We will go out the front door. And so they did. And when they pushed that door open, the men saw the crack of light. They tossed the jackets. The lantern light spread into the clearing. But a miracle happened. No people they beheld. This family became invisible. Walking so close, even the dogs, they didn't know they were there. They came to the banks of the river and looked to little Mo to lead them. He said, I've never been here at night. I can't find the way. But his father was undaunted. He lifted the boy, balances on his hip till their skin touched. He said, little boy, little boy, you know what your name is. Little Mo, but that's not your real name, son. I know now why we named you this, the hours at hand, son. Your name is Moses. Now, Moses, get us across that water. Up and down the river, he found the stones finally, and he dashed across into Martha Tom's house. He said, I'm sorry, I know you're sleeping, but it's me. It's little Mo. My mama's been sold there after us. Can you help me? It's, 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 it's Moses. Can you give me a hand here? She jumped up. She threw her clothes on. She said, get back across that river. Hide your family in the tall river cane. You'll know when it's safe to cross. Now go. And he did. And here come the dogs and the lanterns, and they were hiding in the cane. 
on the Choctaw side. She went to every house. She flung the doors open. She said, women, put on your white dresses. Bring a lit candle. Meet me at the river. We're having a ceremony tonight. The crossing kind. And when everything came to pass, just as I've told you, those men on the slave side of the river with the dogs and lanterns and the guns, they saw emerging from the Choctaw fog what looked to them like a band of angels. And then not 10 feet in front of them, they saw them standing up and shimmering and shining and coming to life before their eyes. They saw them, seven runaway slaves. They lifted their shotguns and pointed them to the backs. But their fingers froze on the trigger. For stepping out of the Choctaw fog came the most beautiful little angel of them all. Her right hand held a candle. Her left hand was outstretched. It was Martha Tom, and she was walking on the water and singing a song they'd heard the slaves sing many times in the fields, but never in the language she sang it. She sang. We are bound for the promised land. She took little Mo by the hand, and he took his mother, and she took her husband, and he took the children, and together all seven of them went crossing Bocchetto. When they reached the fog on the Choctaw side, they blew the candles out and disappeared into the lightness of it all, never to be seen on the plantation side ever again. But in Neshoba County, Mississippi, where I first heard this story, they'll still talk about the bravery of that Choctaw Martha Tom. They still talk about the faith of that boy they've come to call Moses. But maybe the best version of this story is told by the descendants of those men with the dogs and the lanterns and the guns. For they tell about the night their forefathers witnessed seven black spirits walking on the water to their freedom. To their freedom, to their free. That's why we gather together to celebrate our cultural diversities, we've come to call them, but we should always remember we gather together for in a deeper, finer place. We are no different. We all seek the same thing, safety and joy for those we know and love. We're all members of the human <laughs> walk. It never was a race. There's no competition here. Closer and closer we come to the house, to the house we seek, step by step, stone by stone, book by book, hope by hope, story by story, song, dream, book, stone, Closer and closer and closer we come to the house of everybody. To the house of every, every, everybody. To the house of everybody is welcome here. Freedom. Yakoki. Thanks, Tim. Um, a little more by way of introduction for DJ. Uh, DJ is um, a counselor in an Indian health clinic in Oklahoma City. Very large clinic, very, very successful treating about 17,000 patients, different patients each year. Some of them, of course, treated multiple times and so that's an amazing accomplishment, and uh, they have done all this uh, as a nonprofit organization. Uh, she works, as I said, as a counselor, and so she has to deal with multiple tribes and multiple ways and different views of the world. 
And uh, part of what she does is incorporate old ways, traditions, and so forth in her visiting with other people. And part of the old ways include the flute.
my relations. Hake Namenoma. DJ and Tim and I want to express our appreciation to the Library of Congress for uh, letting us come and visit with you today. Hope you had a nice time and uh, go out and read a little bit and listen a little bit and uh, learn a little more about Choctaws and other folks. Goodbye. Oh, there's no goodbye. There's no goodbye in Choctaw, unless you mean it forever and eternity. So we say later in English, later, or chapisilachiki. Is that right? Thank you. Tim Tingle, DJ Batiste Tomasi, and Roger Harris. Thank you again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.